Uh, my name is John Michael Weber, and I'm going to talk today about uh, an addict's first memory and rethinking recover, uh, relapse. Uh, I'm a master's level licensed chemical dependency counselor, and I'm currently, sorry, I'm approving this. I'm lost on this. I'm better in person. <laughs> You're, you know oh. what? You're doing a great job. There you go. You just press play. Okay. You're, you're, you're perfect. Thank you. Okay. At any rate, I'm current, I just left Amethyst Health to take a sabbatical to finish my doctorate in traumatology. Uh, and I'm doing also virtual counseling with schrecovery.org. But uh, anyway, let me start by saying that the inspiration for this Are you controlling my screen or? There we go. I'm a, I, it's important to note that I am a recovering addict and I've been so clean and sober since uh, November 19, 2001. Um, the rest I told you. And the inspiration for the following presentation is inspired by my own struggle with childhood trauma resulting in addiction. So, and I'll shorten this, but basically what I did when I was working in the field, and I still am doing this, is I took a small portion, 175 people addicted to some form of substance from alcohol to heroin. And I asked them one question. And out of those 175 people, they all answered the same thing with the exception of two. So that's a pretty broad scope and it's, and it's certainly observational research, but uh, the question I asked them is, what is your very first memory? And without fail, they all said it was something that was traumatic. And, I, and I'll give you an example by using my story. At the age of three, there was a traumatic event in my life. I was predisposed genetically to alcoholism I knew not how to process that event and was in a state of chaotic internal war. At age 12, I drank a quart of beer and the chaos went away. For 30 years, I chased the sense of normality that could only be found in bottles, pipes, and syringes, and I would add pills. Uh, for 10 years, I got before I got sober, I found heroin. Heroin worked every time. It also alienated literally everyone from my life. I am now a drug counselor and a doctoral student. And this presentation is to show what I believe is missing in our recovery models. Through my research, I believe there is a way to minimize relapse. The following is how I arrived at this theory. So if you follow my timeline from age 43 to present or, or from age 43, I've been sober, I'm 63 now. Uh, but at birth, three to three years old, I experienced the trauma. I took on guilt and insecurity at age 12. I drank at age 14, I used the needle and countless arrests began, heroin use, uh, five relapses, and then and the story goes on. It is painfully obvious that in the field of SUD recovery, there is a need for improvement. The SUD recovery fields of psychiatry, psychotherapy, medical and clinical practices should work integrated and congruently, not, separate, not at separate levels. The fields cannot be islands. The 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, medically assisted treatment and talk therapy all fail when standing alone. This work explores how perhaps that could all be done differently. Trauma is a developmental, I can't read what I'm right here. Maybe you could see it. Oh, I'm sorry. Can't go back. Anyway, it's my belief that the key to long term recovery is cognitive behavioral therapy from day one of treatment. Assume the clients that are addicted to drugs 
at one point in her life experienced the trauma. It is my hope that the theory that follows will be given due diligence for implementation into the recovery model of SUD. Those individuals that never deal with their childhood or adult trauma will continue to find the need to use chemicals to, due to the undiscovered key to process in that event. Those who are treated for PTSD in congruence with substance use are able to process the event and understand the guilt they have been carrying was not reason for their drug abuse. There's gender differentials, gender differences in trauma-related risk factors for alcohol and drug abuse have also been reported. One study based on data from adolescent samples suggests that that traumatic event exposure increases risk for SUDs for young women, but not young men. Another study also suggests that the existence of a gender difference in com comorbidity in men drug use preceded drug use preceded the exposure to the event, while in women the onset age of both drug use and exposure to an event were nearly identical. It has been this writer's experience that the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and all other 12 steps programs, that there is an overwhelming majority of women that have were sexually abused in childhood. It has further been observed that men do experience sexual abuse, but they're little bit slower on the uptake as far as giving up that information. It may take them two or three relapses before they're ready to talk about something like that. And the child experiences affect the brain development in a similar manner, learning to speak or walk, causing certain synapses or connections between neurons to develop or grow strong or break. Specifically, the negative experience of the childhood maltreatment is believed to be behind certain anomalies in the brain structure that result in cognitive behavioral impairment, O'Leary 2020. The person-centered theory, or when put to action, person-centered therapy, was developed by Carl Rogers. And basically to shorten this, it, it got us away from, from uh, behavior modification and into the more common cognitive behavioral. There are three concepts of persons in therapy, and that is self-actualization, positive regard, regard and congruence. Self-actualization, -actual person reaches full potential by discovering oneself and, pot and potential growth. A person's need for acceptance, appreciation, and love by others, and I'll leave it at that. Self-concept, the real self, and the ideal self. When these three are in agreement, the person has congruence. Aaron Beck believed that Thinking changes feelings and behavior follows. I can't read all of this, but anyway, thoughts, feelings, behavior. In other words, if you change the way we think, our behavior follows that thinking. Narrative therapy, which I'm very fond of because the way I look at this is if you were to look at the last paragraph of the Bible when it's telling us don't change a word in this. You know, you say, well, that's great, but how did we arrive here? When I deal with an addict and they're sitting in front of me, I'm seeing the ex existential version of him right here, right now. This is who he is, but how did he get here? And I need to know the whole story in order to deal with the rest of it. And narrative therapy is considered non blaming, no fault approach. So the proposed therapeutic model is, again, it's not my intent to reinvent anything, just to add to it. And I believe that if we take into account that 
the person has a mental disorder. It's not if, it's they do. And that is why they use drugs and alcohol. Then we can deal with the acute inpatient rehab, the subacute, the outpatient and recovery. And then going along with all of these ongoing trauma therapy following the detox. It's a holistic approach and it, and it is peaceful mind, body and spirit, the whole package. And these are my, that's my information. I want to just, if I can get out of the screen somehow. <laughs> 